Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Warehouse Digitization, How RFID Automation is Increasing Supply Chain Responsiveness and Profitability in an Era of Change. At this time, all participants have been placed on a listen-only mode, and we'll open the floor for your questions and comments after the presentation. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to your host, Bruce Chan. Sir, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Matthew, and uh, good morning to everyone out there. Uh, welcome to our discussion on Warehouse Digitization and RFID. Uh, my name is Bruce Chan. I'm the Global Logistics Analyst here at Stiefel. Uh, we're really pleased to welcome Carrier Direct back to the forum. Uh, for those of you that remember, they were with us uh, about a couple months ago now to discuss TMS selection. Uh, I know that you know a couple months probably seems like a couple years ago with everything that's gone on, but uh, we're very pleased to have them with us all the same. Um, from the team at Carrier Direct, we've got Joe Junka, who is the firm's VP of Technology and Strategy. Uh, he brings uh, to the forum today uh, about two decades of software engineering and digital design and development experience. Um, so, you know, great to have him on board. Uh, our other guests today include Dan Deephouse, who um, also brings some deep experience in the software development and cloud integration space. Uh, he's had, uh, you know, a number of roles, as you'll see from his bio, uh, at a number of different companies throughout a very successful career, but uh, he currently helms CargoCast which is a cloud service logistics provider that specializes in process automation and IoT. Uh, that, of course, has become a very hot topic as of late. We've also got Adrian Turchip with us. He's the SVP of Strategy and Corporate Development for RF Controls. Uh, in that role, Adrian has become, I'd say, you know, very well-versed in the implementation and practical application of the company's products. Uh, we're very excited for him to share some of that experience with us. And uh, last but not least, we've got Jason Ivey. Uh, Jason is a senior manager at the firm's, uh, or in the firm's logistics practice, I should say. Uh, he's probably spent more time thinking about smart labeling than is healthy. Um, and he's also an electrical engineer, so, uh, you know, he's the real deal. Uh, as you can see, you know, we've got uh, a lot of deep and practical experience to share with you today. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about the real nuts and bolts and the fundamentals of what's going on in warehousing and supply chain uh, in terms of innovation, in terms of tracking, in terms of inventory management. Um, uh, you know, I know this hasn't always been the sexiest field, but, you know, with the explosive growth of e-commerce out there, with, you know, the instantaneous lead times that you've been seeing, and uh, with, you know, I think what's been more topical, the fractalization of production and, and manufacturing sourcing, whether it's because of COVID fears or because of Trump tariffs, um, this is a topic that, that's, you know, really burst into the limelight in our view. Um, so, you know, strap in, get your questions ready. We'll have uh, some, some time at the end of the discussion to entertain them. Uh, but first, I'm going to hand it over to Joe, who's going to start us off with a presentation. Uh, by the way, if you haven't received a copy of the presentation, you can send an email to my associate, Roxana Islam. Her email address is islamr at stifel.com, which is I-S-L-A-M-R at S-T-I-F-E-L.com. Again, she'd be happy to send you a copy. Uh, but uh, without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to you, Joe. Please go ahead. Thanks for having us, Bruce. I'm, I'm, I'm particularly excited about this one. This is going to be a fun session. This conversation is, is about overhead RFID antennas that turn your warehouse into a real-time X-ray machine that can track any pallet, product, or item's location in real time. And most interestingly, you know, we're, we're, we're here to talk about the ways that, that that allows you to automate, improve processes, and uh, efficiency. So let's head over to slide three. Bruce, you did a fantastic job giving us an intro. Um, I really appreciate that. But, you know, this is a group of folks who've, who've been in the industry for a while. Um, we're actively engaged in um, some of these pilot activities that we're going to talk about. And, and I just want to give everybody a chance to, to introduce themselves on slide three, just so, you re so the listeners can recognize our voices. So I'll start. Uh, again, I'm Joseph Yunka. I'm the VP of Tech Strategy at Carrier Direct. Carrier Direct is a consulting firm that specializes specifically in freight and transportation. And uh, my job every day is to help, help our customers uh, realize their technology strategies and visions. Um, how do we transform from today's status quo to tomorrow's you know, new state? Hi, folks. My name is Dan Deepas. I'm founder and CEO of CargoCast. We're a cloud service. Uh, we use IoT data to automate, automate and optimize warehouses in real time. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Adrian Turchette. I'm the um, Senior VP of our Global Channel Partnership Strategy. My focus is to accelerate and scale the adoption of our next-gen RFID, uh, which we manufacture right here in the United States. Jason Ivey, and I work for Avery Dennison, and I lead our logistics RFID market development for North America. Uh, Avery Dennison is a global material science and manufacturing company, and we specialize in the design and manufacture of a wide variety of labeling and functional materials. Uh, the company's products are used in nearly every major industry, and we're also the world's largest UHF RFID partner with more than 50% global market share in apparel and footwear. Wow, that's nice. Cool. So let's go to slide four. Uh, thanks, everybody, for the intros. Let's go to slide four um, and start talking about the situation at hand. So supply chains, very specifically for this discussion, warehousing, uh, they weren't really designed for our current reality. And, and, and so this has been a slow transition and then suddenly a giant shaking the snow globe kind of situation. Um, most warehouses are run with very manual labor intensive processes that take time, make them inflexible, vulnerable, and, and you know, slow, frankly. Um, and and today's world is is not, well, let's just look. I mean, the, you know, our supply chain has been transforming for the last, you know, since the beginning times. And, and now over the last three months, we've seen massive volatility, massive testing of our infrastructure. Some have succeeded and some have failed. You know, if you think about e-commerce 20 years ago, starting with uh, starting as a forcing function to, to make uh, distribution networks uh, more efficient, micro warehousing. Now we have hordes of sprinter van networks. Um, you know, transformation was kind of ticking along. Amazon, Walmart have all been big, big, uh, big forces there. Um, globally, we're seeing uh, demand and supply issues. Um, coming from our global partners, including, you know, caused by things by, like labor shortages. We're seeing, uh, well, trade wars. And then finally, COVID. I mean, I wish you could see me gesturing broadly at everything, but, uh, you know, the world is a pretty interesting place. These last six months, is, uh, it's very different. And, and some of our customers are seeing supply and demand changes from, you know, drops of 90% to demand increases of 1,000%. Um, you know, it's just, and how do you how do you build a system that can be nimble enough to handle that? So I'm going to hand it over to Jason Ivey um, to talk more about supply chain automate, automation. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about connecting physical objects and digital systems. And, and as Jason said, Avery Dennison is a arguably a category killer in in that space. Um, also, Jason, hey, uh, special uh, congratulations on your SmartTrack acquisition. Uh, thanks, Joe. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so if you'll move to slide five. Um, so with the challenges Joe just mentioned, uh, I'd like to discuss how technology can help, specifically by applying the Internet of Things to the supply chain. Um, at the top here, you have the supply chain, starting with raw materials on the left, then being manufactured into finished goods, and finally purchased by consumers like you and me. Now, if we could accurately track goods as they flow through the supply chain, then we could better manage the challenges that e-commerce, globalization, and even pandemics bring. And by applying the Internet of Things to the supply chain, we can provide this visibility with accuracy and in real time. So what does IoT apply to the supply chain look like? Well, in the simplistic view, you've got the Internet. Um, they're right under the supply chain. The internet aspect would be the logistics systems that manage the movement of these goods. And the things aspect would be the physical goods themselves. So let's talk about the logistics systems. Um, what we're really talking about here are ERPs, uh, manufacturing execution systems, warehouse management systems, transportation all the systems that are involved in moving these goods to the supply chain. And the logos you see here are just some examples of these systems. Um, now, 
It's worth noting in recent years, these logistic systems have invested big development dollars to enable IoT. Um, you know, they've increased big data ingestion capability. Um, they've increased cloud processing speeds. Um, they've added these, you know, these visualization control towers so they can see goods throughout the supply chain. Um, they're even putting in AI capabilities for advanced analytics and automation. So all of these features they're putting in are for IoT goods and asset visibility across the supply chain. Um, uh, if you research these companies and you just look at some of the systems platform and function names, uh, you can really see their focus. Uh, as an example, Blue Yonder's Luminate platform or Infor's Nexus Supply Chain Visibility platform. Um, SAP Leonardo has connected goods and global track and trace functions. These are all focused on increasing supply chain visibility. Now, if you go to the bottom of this slide, um, you will see the IoT things that we would like to track. Now, this could be, you know, pallets at a crosstalk operation. It could be parcels at a sortation facility. Um, it could even be the consumable items themselves that are being packed at a fulfillment center. But between the internet and the things, you have this human connectivity layer. And this is where the full promise of supply chain IoT falls apart, at least today. So as long as we're relying on humans for barcode scans or manually keying inputs into systems, or even using pen and paper to track these goods, um, we will continue to have these costly errors, time-consuming delays in products flowing through the supply chain, and increased inefficiencies. Um, so just think about, you know, additional costs that you're spending perhaps today in cycle count, uh, or maybe, um, you know, the, the, the price that you're paying for increased labor um, these are all things that, um, you know, really cause delays, and this is really what we're going to talk about resolving. Um, so we call this the supply chain IoT gap. So if you go to slide six. So, so today we're going to really talk about how we fill this IoT gap and enable what we call smart logistics. So once we can digitally connect physical goods to logistic systems without human intervention, um, we can have accurate real-time inventory visibility so that we can really truly activate elastic supply chain networks. And we can do it across global supply chains. And we do all of this without manual product scans, you know, increasing our supply chain velocity. Um, by having the supply chain velocity, it not only saves us cost, but we can better support the pressures for same-day deliveries. And imagine what a digitally connected supply chain can do during a pandemic. It could easily take the guesswork out of PPE and ventilator inventory, I assure you. So at the bottom of this chart, um, you can see that you know, other technologies are also being applied to logistics. Um, what we're seeing is that once you digitally connect goods in the supply chain, you can now add to other technologies to build even smarter logistics. As an example, with digitally connected goods, robots and AGVs could autonomously identify the products they are transporting in a warehouse, and AI algorithms can optimize their path for pick and put away operations. So this is really the backdrop of what we're gonna talk about today. I'm now gonna pass it over to my colleague, Adrian from RF Controls to explain how exactly we create digitally connected goods using UHF RFID. I've enjoyed working with Adrian and what's unique about RF Controls is not only their overhead readers that enable smart logistics, but also that these readers can be installed in high ceilings, commonly found in warehouses for real-time location level traceability, not to mention increased project ROI. 
Adrian, I'll hand it over to you now. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I'll start off by saying that uh, Avery Dennison has been a partner of RF Controls for a few years now, and really our focus together has been leveraging, you know, the wide growth in RFID adoption and setting a stage for, you know, a new high-performance overhead system, which can turn low-cost, battery-free RFID tags into essentially passive real-time location solutions. Um, ultimately, this enables additional use, use cases and increases the value per tag across supply chains. So when most people think about RFID, they picture a portal, a handheld scanner, a desktop printer, and if you've been following Avery Dennison, you might have even seen their new handheld printer. So you know maybe some of you are testing RFID right now in initial pilots, or you're at a more mature stage and you're looking to actually automate RFID and get more out of the tags that you're buying. As the picture shows here, our value add is driven by our up and out of the way, always on, ubiquitous approach to covering an entire facility. It's a seamless networked array of stirrable beam antennas, so to speak. Each PoE powered device or ceiling tile, as some of our customers call them, has a built-in reader uh, with the ability to continuously identify, locate, and track tags with pinpoint accuracy in and around the one to two feet. And get this, you know, we're, we're operating from ceilings of, of 10 to 50 feet in terms of installations. In the environment that you can see on the slide below, uh, this is inside the CargoCast Innovation Center. I highly recommend, uh, you know, people reach out and actually go see this facility in, in Atlanta. Um, there we've developed and demonstrated use cases for smart logistics with an initial focus on freight, freight providers. Um, Dan and, and the team at CargoCast has diligently tested enough overhead RFID solutions to determine that our CS smart antenna offers the most consistent granular data and delivers performance at the edge. RF controls has always been a leader in long range RFID beam steering, as Jason mentions, and we have taken a unique patentable approach and we've spent our time focusing on decreasing the size of the antenna while increasing the scan speed, essentially right-sizing the read distance for the appropriate ceiling height, all while maintaining the pinpoint location accuracy performance at an affordable cost. Now, that sounds easy, and RF Controls has been at this a lot longer than, than, than I've been here at the company, um, but I'm ultimately extremely thrilled to announce that uh, you know, we, the team won Best New Product at RFID Journal Live last year, and uh, we got nominated again for our newest product, which again, uh, doubles the read distance. So, you know, when you're considering an overhead RFID, it's important to understand speed, distance, and accuracy, which are three factors that can make or break a particular uh, in, uh, deployment, particularly in high tag density environments. I think that's an important thing to notice. It's important because the global adoption of RFID today means that freight providers don't always control all the tags inside their facility. So for example, a tagged item inside of a box is a factor to be considered when testing overhead performance. So again, we, we, we've stressed this before, the purpose of this, you know, one of the purpose of this webinar is to focus our attention on one of the most significant points of differentiation from all competition, which is our ability to operate in high ceilings. Customers looking for a passive RTLS approach inside of a warehouse, a cross docking facility, or a distribution center are typically unable to drop the ceilings due to health and safety limitations. Um, so one of my favorite parts of working with RF controls is watching the customers who have installed hundreds, tens or hundreds of CS smart antennas in a single network facility and watching them focus on transforming their operational model capturing new data streams and picking up ROIs, not just inside their facilities, but across their supply chains. From a single wall-to-wall -wall environment, and the right partners, of course, it's possible to leap ahead and start thinking about inventory versus asset tracking as continuous data streams, while it unlocks what you've been trying to manage this entire time. It's our partners, Avery, CargoCast, Carrier Direct, among others, which ultimately help us scale 
and usher in the expertise to land and expand across tens or hundreds of facilities for our customers. Last thing to note on this slide, it is often, our, our, it is often that our RFID approach either augments or eliminates the requirement for other battery powered BLE or ultra wideband RTLS infrastructure that some of you might be very familiar with. In fact, for assets such as forklifts, for example, CargoCast has designed software to group multiple tags on the forklift, creating a geofence around the edges. This enables our overhead system to lock on and track forklifts even at high speeds. However, if there is an RTLS solution already in place, it likely doesn't track the millions of pallets and boxes which move dynamically across your supply chain, supply chain each year. In this case, the two systems can seamlessly be integrated if desired. So these are all things, again, which are critical steps to bridging the IoT gap. I'm gonna move over to slide eight, which is really about adoption and retail versus 3PL. As you can see in the chart on the right, it clearly addresses a question, what has changed in RFID? And if you look at the last five years, there's been tremendous adoption in retail leading the pack. It's this growth which is changing the playing field and delivering big wins for those innovating. As you can see, only 40% of 3PLs have reported an initial RFID adoption somewhere inside their company. This is relatively low considering, again, this could just be an early implementation with a portal and a handheld. We have, however, seen a desire in the market to leap ahead future-proof companies using digital ceilings in a way that enhances the value and automates RFID. Uh, I'm excited to turn it over to Dan, CEO of CargoCast, um, previous founder of MuleSoft, I should, I should note. Uh, it's his passion to deliver a turnkey freight solution using our overhead RFID, which is more than any person in my position could ask for. He has intelligently designed a way for freight providers to easily install our system and bring them one step closer to achieving their digital twin. Dan, over to you. Thanks, Adrian. Appreciate that. Um, this has all been kind of fairly theoretical so far, so I want to kind of dive in and talk a little bit about how we can actually apply this technology. Uh, the, this technology really has not been practical in the warehouse previous to, to where we've been, right? The, the technology that our controls has developed is it has now made it feasible and scalable that we can go implement it in a large warehouse. And we've been working to leverage that with that real-time IoT data to really understand what's happening. You know, we can now see everything that's happening in real time in a warehouse. And that, that just really opens up all sorts of possibilities. And so if you go to slide nine, uh, I'll talk about the, the first possibility I want to dive into. It's real-time inventory. If you're familiar with RFID, this is this is probably something you already know about. But I, I want to make sure that the the benefits are clear. Right on the on the right there, you see maybe a, a typical fulfillment center where where they're tracking everything and and using that inventory data in real time to help optimize their operation. So if you know everything in real time where it is you don't need to do the inventory counts because you stopped doing inventory counting um, and you've now automated it you actually have the elimination of errors and because you're you're now confident in your inventory counting you can reduce your safety stock you're reducing the risk of production delays and you know, just by knowing where things are, you've also uh, solved a lot of questions around like, where is this thing? If any of you have multiple facilities, you'll know that oftentimes you're, you're on the phone finger pointing like, hey, it went on this truck. No, it didn't go on the truck. And, you know, the, the reality of logistics is, is that happens. And this just kind of instantly takes out a lot of that hidden cost. There's also the ability to uh, correlate this information with security camera information to deter and detect theft. 
Uh, we're working with customers right now, you know, who have high value goods uh, or, you know, high value textiles. And if you can understand where things are in real time, you, you can make sure that, that you don't lose them, frankly. Um, so ju just knowing where everything is has a lot of, of benefits. But I think, you know, the, the opportunity here is now to take not just where is everything statically, but now we can look at where things are as they dynamically move. And so if you go over to step 10 or slide 10, can talk a little bit about shipment verification, right? Because we can see what is coming in and out of the warehouse. We can validate that that matches the manifest for the truck. Or if you're loading a plane and creating a ULD, we can validate that what goes on to that ULD in real time is what matches that manifest. And you know, we're working with one uh, a medium-sized freight forwarder. They spend over a million dollars a year just counting pieces and validating that everything is there as they come off the truck. That's a pretty big investment and a pretty big staff investment for an industry that has a hard time uh, keeping people in these positions and, and finding people. You know, I think uh, I've heard one statistic like there, there are six times as many positions as there are people to fulfill them. So, you know, anything that we can automate helps, I think, retain retain those people so they can focus on their, their higher level jobs and um, helps, helps you scale better as an operation. So we, we've got the benefits around uh, the efficiency savings. We've got the benefits around staff happiness, but there are, there are a lot of other benefits then that you get as well. We can, you, know, you eliminate shipping and manifest errors because you've eliminated those, your quality is going up. And because your quality is going up, you're gonna get more business from your customers and, and new customers. So there's a direct top line revenue benefit for this. And then another interesting thing is that because you're moving goods faster, you don't need to, or be, because you're, you're automatically validating them, you can clear the staging area very quickly and use more of that space for storage. So you're improving your warehouse utilization. So moving on to slide 11, this is where for me it gets, it's really exciting with some of the technology things, like this just hasn't been possible before. We can not only see where everything is, but we can, we can track where it's moving and use that information to optimize and manage the workforce in real time. Uh, my, my colleague Jason here on the call from Avery likes to talk about this as being like Uber for forklifts. And if, and if you take a peek ahead to slide 12, on the right hand side there, you can see what a heads up display might look like uh, for a forklift, because we can actually direct those forklifts to the right task at the right time. So that, that picture there is showing that forklift driver to go pick a pallet and telling them where to bring it. In high velocity you know, environments, like the cross docking environment you see on slide 11, this can have major impacts in, in productivity. You're moving throughput much faster. Um, you can reduce the fleet size. You can eliminate the, the errors and all the costs that go around with fixing those errors. And then there's a, there's a lot of improvements around just uh, because you've got, got it there on the screen, the, your training requirements go down, right? They're, they're being directed what to do. There's not as much they have to learn up front around the tribal knowledge of the warehouse. The system can look at, hey, this forklift driver is closest to this truck right now and let's direct them to unload. Or this forklift driver just brought something into the staging area and there's something from the staging area that urgently needs to go to this truck so we can turn it around get that driver back on the road so they can they can start you know using their time for driving miles not for waiting at your delivery dock uh, so you, you can decrease that driver waiting time your door-to-door -door time goes down more of your goods are making out on the the earliest truck possible 
so this one for me is really exciting and, and, you know, where we can go in and we can get that end to end visibility and then funnel in that data to, to optimize your workforce in real time. So from here, I want to pass it back uh, to Joe, you know, Joe and his team have a lot of experience helping logistics and supply chain companies through their journey of digitization and, you know, uh, really want to hear from him around how people can start this journey and, and move forward. Thanks, Dan. So we've covered a lot of content, and and the meat really is how do I how do I try this out? You know, I'm a big fan of small, low risk decisions, and um, the best way to kind of get into this game is 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 really to to understand how it could impact your business with a pilot. So um, what is a pilot? A pilot is 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 quite simply we're on let's let's hop over to slide 13. Um, a pilot is a is a is a you know a single location um, or a portion of a single location that allows you to set up the infrastructure at a much lower cost, much lower risk, and allows you to to really um, see the numbers change as as you're changing your process. Um, so you know we we want to get to ROI. We want to. We want to. We we have, we have some tools today that allow us to do high level ROI, and, and actually I'll talk about that um, as a, as a as a next step to this this presentation. But the um, the pilot is critical. So you know, defining uh, what you do today. So let's just walk through this slide real quick. So if if you think about assessing, you need to understand what um, what. What's your what's your environments like today? How long does it take you to move uh, assets through um, warehouses? How long? Uh, how much labor? And, and and what's the ultimate capacity of a specific location or locations? Uh, and then we start to talk about what we want to achieve. So different companies have different uh, needs uh, from an improvement and efficiency standpoint. Some of them are business differentiating, as as Dan was saying. If you're in a special a, special, a specialized warehousing environment, refrigerated or textiles, you know, you might you might have different kind of uh, processes that are, are opportunities. But but we're seeing, you know, basically as we go into the define phase, we're seeing that the goals that we're establishing with customers are are really, um, I mean, there there are opportunities for this this investment to pay itself off in in 18 months. I mean, this is this is this is kind of no brainer stuff. And so, you know, as we get together and we talk about, okay, so what do I want to achieve? What am I doing today? We have to instrument one of the warehouses, one of the facilities, or partially one of the facilities, and then um, measure the flow, measure the information. So a pilot is basically deploying a small set of infrastructure. Uh, it's, it's having the software that CargoCast or, you know, frankly, you can use your TMS as well. There's a number of, of opportunities, but, you know, um, highly, highly recommend CargoCast. Um, and then, you know, basically the idea is to come out and measure. And so uh, the end result of this journey, of this pilot journey is to come back with a report to say, look, you know, we, today, this is what our warehouses are doing. And, and uh, from a volume standpoint and from a capacity and from um, capability and, and tomorrow deploying this information, the, deploying this infrastructure, we're going to see um, the equivalent of adding 50% on to the real estate. Like imagine a crosstalk facility that performs 50% better um, and you don't have to have more property added, <laughs> if you will. Um, we're seeing, you know, opportunities where uh, staging is going away. Imagine that world where, you know, it goes, the trucks arrive in a highly scheduled environment. Now we all know truck schedules are a thing, but let's pretend that they can, they can actually make it on time. And we dock in and, you know, literally the forklifts are carrying from truck A to truck B. Um, you know, there's no staging that has to happen. And the systems are measuring the entire process in real time. There's a ton of opportunity here. Uh, let's hit slide 14 and talk about next steps. So, you know, we've obviously shared a lot of information. I want you to go to this, this URL that's on the slide because we've put together a video, very specifically CargoCast has put together a video that shows the, the experience inside the warehouse. You'll see a forklift moving through and loading. You'll see uh, the information systems measuring in real time. 
it, it, it does ask for your email address. We promise not to spam. We're just making sure that we don't get robocalled or, you know, a bunch of people dial in and, and uh, you know, whatever. But uh, yes. In, in addition to that, we have the ability to, um, you know, we have the ability to talk about an ROI assessment. Uh, and, and most interesting, when travel unlocks again after COVID, uh, which we're, we're already seeing, we have the opportunity to invite you to the CargoCast Innovation Center in Atlanta. It's a 10,000 square foot facility, fully wired up with this infrastructure and um, built to, to pilot concepts. So, you know, if we want to talk about, you know, empty fork time, or if we want to talk about um, asset for, for, uh, loss prevention or damage prevention, uh, this is the place where those use cases kind of get tested out. So, you know, that's kind of the, that's kind of the discussion we're having today. Um, I'm excited that we're about to walk into um, a Q&A uh, opportunity. Um, Bruce, take us take us on. Great. Well, thanks, gents, for a really enlightening presentation. Um, Matthew, if you could just go ahead and give everybody the prompt to ask questions. Certainly. Ladies and gentlemen, the floor is now open for questions. If you have any questions or comments, please press star 1 on your phone at this time. We do ask that while posing your question, please pick up your handset if you're listening on speakerphone to provide optimum sound quality. Once again, if you have any questions or comments, please press star 1 on your phone at any time. Thank you. Great. And while we build the queue, maybe a couple questions from my side. Uh, there was some mention about you know, compatibility and, and global standards. And I'm just wondering, you know, when you're talking about um, you know, one retailer having your own sort of RFID system certainly makes sense. But when you talk about introducing other carrier partners, other logistics partners, you know, how does this technology work as far as compatibility? Um, and, and where does each player in the chain have to be to be able to make, you know, this technology, um, I guess, really function up to its potential? Yeah, this is Jason Ivey with Avery Dennis, and um, I can take this. Um, cool. Well, you know, one of the things that's occurred in the in the industry for UHF RFID is, um, you know, they've standardized on, uh, you know, a Gen 2 protocol. Um, and what that's allowed is, is really for everyone to get on board in terms of, you know, you've got a myriad of different, um, you know, providers of readers, whether it be handheld or fixed. Um, you've got various uh, providers of encoders for, you know, basically uh, programming the tag um, via, um, you know, a printer or, you know, a, a reader. Uh, so with all of this movement and the fact that, um, you know, this is, the cool thing is this is, not, this is not an emerging technology from a technology itself. It's been around for many, many years. And so what has been able to happen as popularity has grown in multiple industries is that, you know, we've now got a standard that basically can, um, you know, any of these devices in, in multiple industries can use uh, this technology. Um, and Adrian, I don't know if you want to expound upon that. No, yeah, uh, what I would say to that is, is that, you know, our system is designed to send a single uh, a true data stream using, you know, REST APIs or WebSockets. So essentially, we're 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 a fire hose of data to, uh, you know, uh, an enterprise edge edge device middleware, sorry, middleware or or enterprise software. So, uh, you know, CargoCast is receiving, you know, WebSockets from uh, from our controls, whereby we're pushing data uh, at them as fast as we see it. So, so this is so I guess, Dan here. I, I just want to add one small point on this, which is, you know, we're we're also helping the handoff between different logistics companies, right? Like we're we're working on a pilot where uh, there's a major manufacturer handing off to uh, a major uh, freight forwarding facility, and you know, there's errors and there's finger pointing there, and you know. RFID provides that compatibility for digital handoff, but then also we can we can help the data exchange as part of that. So there's no paper and there's no you know no manual check-in. Um, so so there's there's kind of opportunities at at different levels. If you just want to standardize an RFID or if, or if you want to go further on the data exchange, that's something that that we help with as well. 
Okay, that, that's very helpful. And, you know, apologies if this is a simplistic question. You know, I'm not really a, a tech guy, so bear with me. Uh, but I think it was you, Jason, that mentioned that this is a technology that's been around for quite a while. Um, so when I think about, you know, why it hasn't really, um, you know, blossomed as much or, or um, you know, dispersed as much, uh, you know, as, as one would think, given all the benefits that you've talked about, um, at least until recent years, would it be, you know, because you've got all these devices putting data out there and we just haven't really had the capability to digest it and process it? I guess the sort of idea that, you know, big data is one thing, but turning big data into information is another? Or is it something completely different like like costs, like, you know, the cost per unit, the cost yeah. per piece, the cost per parcel is too high? Yeah, you're on to a good point because, um, you know, as Adrian said in his slide on market adoption, um, and you saw the 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 chart growth. Um, and and by the way, that you know that chart was um, you know RFID tag growth, um, and that's the, those are annual figures. So um, the reason why you see this growth, it's it's, it's really two part. One is um, from a cost standpoint, certainly. Uh, the technology, right, and, and the ability, you know, there's advances in the chip, for example, that goes on the RFID tag. Um, you know, the chips are getting smaller. They're getting more powerful in terms of storage and capability and sensitivity. Um, so between, you know, the components that make up the RFID tag, right, the chip and the antenna, uh, to the manufacturing capabilities, um, like what we've done at Avery Denison, you know, we're getting more and more, um, you know, innovative in how we manufacture these uh, RFID inlays, not only from a cost position, but also from a quality standpoint. Um, so you take that, and then the other side of it is also um, the, as you said, the use of being able to take the read information and be able to, you know, handle all those reads from an Internet of Things standpoint that I talked about, right? Those systems of records like the Blue Yonders and the Enforce, you know, building in that cap capability to where you can actually do something with the data. And I don't mean just look at it and, you know, uh, do analytics, uh, which is great, but I mean actively uh, automate your processes. I think it's a combination of those two things um, that's really uh, activated this adoption. Okay, great. That's that's terrific. Um, Matthew, do we have any questions on the line? Uh, yes. Your first question is coming from Eli Siloero. Your line is live. Hi. Yes. Uh, this is Eli Siloero from from Care Direct. Shout out Joe and uh, really the rest of the team here. Thank you uh, a lot for for this presentation. It's really great. <laughs> My uh, my question is for for Dan. Um, you mentioned that you know the the RFID technology can help with inventory counting. Um, I was wondering if the RFID technology satisfies the legal requirement from auditors to conduct you know whether it's yearly or multiple times a year uh, inventory counts in warehouses. Um, does that does the technology handle that, or does that still have to be a manual thing to check that each year? You know, I, I haven't been been asked that question before. I, I mean, I, I would assume so. Um, Jason or or um, Adrian, have you encountered that question before? Uh, it's Adrian here. No, I haven't. But um, you know, I think it, it you know it ultimately could be a, a phased approach um, in terms of you know initially uh, relying on um, you know manual counting and then moving over to seeing you know how how you can do it digitally. Um, but, you know, I think it's a good question because if, if the answer is yes, you know, it just adds to the ROI of, of having a system like this, which is what we're constantly seeing. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I know a lot of uh, big warehouse and distribution centers put a lot of time and effort into that, that manual account. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna just toss in real quick too. I while I have not gone through this journey specifically, um, you know, we are seeing uh, as the technology in, in in new markets proves out. So this would be something uh, where you know it has to it has to be deployed to prove its accuracy. 
but you know you're seeing the adoption in retail because that case is proven right that the retail is using this for loss prevention at the SKU level like the rfid tags at the SKU level and you know we've got the, the thing that we didn't talk about earlier about why this what what switch is flipped and why rfid is a thing is adrian's antennas are um 50 feet in the air and they have a phased array that, that effectively scans the room 90 feet away uh to, to 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 you know create 3d accuracy down to a plus or minus a foot um you know that accuracy alone gives me hope that as we build these infra as we build this infrastructure out auditing systems will be able to be certified uh, and we'll be able to prove that accuracy uh as we get these deployments in place i hope that helps thank you your next question is coming from chris coombs your line is live. And Chris, your line is live. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so this is Chris Coons from Google. We have a pretty large install of RF controls and antennas uh, at our facilities. And um, we're kind of wondering, do we see a trend that companies are starting to put RFID tags on their products before they ship them, like at the end of the line, is it kind of getting to the point where they're able to say, you know, this is becoming a standard and all of our products should have an RFID label on them as they exit our building? Um, this is Jason Ivy with one, Avery Denison. Um, let me take that from one perspective and then I'll, I'll uh, pass it to Adrian, which I'm sure he has a perspective on it. Um, the answer is yes. Um, and the, the best example is uh, apparel and footwear. Um, if you recall the chart that Adrian showed on the market adoption, um, uh, apparel and, and footwear, that, that whole area is you know 92% adopted. And what's happened, they've been on a journey. Um, you know, originally when they started out, they started tagging somewhere in the supply chain prior to manufacturing. Um, but now you're seeing almost, I mean, a great majority of those uh, providers uh, tagging at source is what we call it, tagging at source. So at the end of the line, when those, um, you know, garments, as an example, are being manufactured, um, they actually have the tag put in at the time that they're manufactured. Um, and we're seeing that also in other areas. And when you saw when it, that that chart I showed about the supply chain that showed it going from raw materials to the end consumer, um, what we're seeing is where companies have adopted RFID later in the supply chain, they're trying to move upstream uh, to the manufacturer. The reason for that is they're 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 seeing the ROI for where they're at, and now they want to move closer uh, up the supply chain so that they can reap the benefits of that tagged item as it's flowing through. So yes, we are seeing that. I would tell you it's a very high growth trend. Uh, Adrian, I don't know if you have another context to that. First of all, Chris, uh, thanks for joining. Um, it's great to hear you, hear your voice. Um, you know, I think ultimately, you know, Jason's right, but you know, that that's part of this whole what's changed in RFID. It's that you know want, you're walking into a warehouse and your customers are filling your your facility with with tags and they're they are also putting pressure on their on their warehouse providers or their logistics providers to to implement RFID and it's this it's this approach that the more people that do it um, you know the better their ROIs the more visibility and there's no there's no gaps in the supply chain so uh, there's definitely a lot of incentives for for people to to get on board. Perfect. I mean, that makes sense. We're currently installing tags on as many things as we possibly can as they come in, but us managing that is a, you know, a, a large cost. So if, the further we can push it upstream, the better. It's, it's become the standard that would really, really help us in every way. Absolutely, J Jason. Maybe you can speak to you know how how a freight provider would be you know tagging at, at the door if uh, you know in a, in a pilot example. Or um, you know what what they, what they might see in in a, in a, in this use case. Yeah, yeah. So uh, from a 
from a freight standpoint, um, we work with customers all the time that, um, let's say on inbound, they have multiple uh, customers that ship to them. Um, when we do a pilot, we we can tag, you know, at at incoming to basically handle a lot of the workflow before it goes to outbound. Um, we've done that in again as as uh, Dan took us through some of the, you know, use cases. Uh, we're able to really you know tell where the ROI and the automation is going to occur from that standpoint. But um, we've also once we've gotten past pilot. We've been able to work with some of those, um, you know, more inbound or going up the supply chain, working with those clients, right, to to tag, for example, let's say they're generating the LPN uh, that goes on the pallet, uh, license plate number that goes on the, the pallet from their destination. We work with them so that they can go and commission the tag at that point so that when it does go to that cross dock or distribution center, it's already tagged. So there's multiple options here, and I would tell you to uh, Joe's point at the end about a pilot, and I would say there is a journey here that you, you start very focused, um, but know this, that it, it only gets better. Once you start, then you can you know land with one particular you know, pilot or use case, and then you can expand through your supply chain from there. So uh, it's a journey. We we do it with customers all the time, and that's just one perspective. Yeah, and I, I think there's an opportunity uh, for Google, somebody like Google, um, to pilot, you know, inbound, right? Like, can we can we start a program? I mean, you guys are a market force. <laughs> so, you know, if you're you're doing this, it's it's a pretty easy ask to say, hey, can you guys label ahead? And, uh, you know, I, I think freight is eager to serve uh, and would be very interested. Long, that was a long answer, guys, but that was, a, that was a great question. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. No, thank you very much. That was great. Thank you. Your next question is coming from Stephen Kerbis. Your line is live. for a great presentation. You know, I'm trying to wrap my head around, uh, first, I should, guess I should back up. Uh, at uh, at ADOE Pile, we function as a, as a 3PL for warehousing. And I'm trying to wrap my head around a situation where these situations where maybe you have a hybrid type uh, operation going on, only because I, I envision we'll handle anything from nuts and bolts to sides of cars. Um, and for nuts and bolts, I don't envision you putting RFI tags on each of the nuts and bolts. So, I, I, if you guys just speak in general to how you see that working in the in the RFID world. Yeah, so this is Dan here uh, from Cargo Cats. We we have um, worked with customers on different levels of tracking. Right, you can you can track at the pallet level, you can track at the case level, you can track at the individual SKU level, and I think it really comes down to your particular process around how you best apply this technology to get the maximum return on investment um, because you can definitely treat you can definitely group things together and treat them as a unit or or you know look at bins or, or totes or things like that and it, you know i think it really just comes down to sitting down and, and evaluating how to how to best do that so you know if, if that's something you're interested in uh, you know i'm sure any of the folks here on the call would be happy to to go through any of those particular scenarios. Does that answer enough of your question or? or yeah, no, 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 it does. Uh, this is a very intriguing, intriguing concept for sure. So. And, and this is Bruce here. Maybe just to follow up on that a little bit and go back to um, Adrian's slide uh, number eight here. Um, certainly that 92% adoption rate among retailers is very encouraging. Um, I'm somewhat surprised to see the only 40% adoption among 3PLs, who you know I normally think of as uh, technology and innovation leaders. And, and just digging into some of the reasons why, you know, is it because um, you know for you know reasons like the last uh, caller mentioned, you know, you've got such a diversity of product coming in from a diversity of customers that it's really hard to you know coordinate um, you know RFID among you know all, all these commodities. Uh, or, or is there something else that's driving a lower adoption rate than in some of the other uh, you know, verticals out there? 
So I just want to chime in a little bit on my experience here. For me, it a lot of this has come down to technology that has been really materially advanced in the last five years, right? Like if you if you look at just the productivity gains around like installing portals, for instance, we were just doing checkpoints. It's a fraction of the overall productivity gains that you can get if you instrument a warehouse and you can see everything that's going on in real time. And so if you go back five years where you're just looking at, okay, what goes in, what goes out, there's definitely ROI there. And we've definitely seen in, you know, shipping and manufacturing for shipment verification on what goes out. Like a, a lot of people have done that, but really this ability to cover what's the warehouse and get that real-time location information is it's new and and combine that with the decreasing chip costs like on the rfid side you know and they they can now print multiple um uh, the rfid chips per wafer so you're getting much better cost efficiencies uh, i mean for me this is like we're essentially now able to ride the coattails of, of retail who have brought the cost down, who have made this technology feasible in a way that hasn't been before. And now all these new use cases in logistics and supply chain are opening up. Yeah, and this is Jason. Let me just add one more thing um, to your question about, well, there's so many different items and it's it's hard to get you know, the tags commissioned and all that. Um, oddly enough, it is that um, diversity in product sets where the technology uh, works best from a standpoint of, you know, whenever you have multiple different SKUs and they've got multiple different locations, it's exactly that compounding effect of ways to have errors in the supply chain um, where this technology works best. Um, so I did want to point that out. It's, it's you know, um, it, it's not when everything goes smoothly and it's like, you know, uh, certainly you can apply RFID to multiple use cases, but where we see a lot of our customers come to us is where all of this different, you know, skew proliferation and different customer sets and different channels and all that, there's so many different ways for errors to occur. That's where we come in and the ROI can be high. Uh, does it have its challenges in terms of where you can commission the tag? Absolutely, but we're, we're breaking those down. We're working with those customers so that we can, so that we can have tags at source. Um, and I think that will, that, that definitely is a trend that will continue. Appreciate all the answers. And uh, Matthew, any, any others left out there on the line? There are no further questions in the queue at this time. Okay, perfect. Well, maybe just one last one from my side uh, as we approach the top of the hour here. There's been a lot of talk about the cost per unit and, and the cost coming down. And I, I recognize that, uh, you know, there is a lot of diversity in the types of tags and products, um, you know, that are available. But just, just a ballpark, you know, what, what kind of cost per unit are we looking at? And is there a um, skew value, you know, below which, um, you know, RFID doesn't make sense anymore? Um, let, let, let me answer that and then start at the tag and then I'll pass it over to Adrian from a, from a reader standpoint or infrastructure. But, um, from a tag viewpoint, um, let me say this is that, you know, there are multiple options now in terms of, uh, tag selection from antenna design to, uh, chip, uh, brand as well as capability. Um, and then when you take that you know, RFID tag and you convert it into a full label. Um, there's just multiple, you know, customer requirements. At Avery Dennison, we work with our customers directly to go and select the right tag. Um, we actually have a facility that, um, you know, we have a lot of engineering capability with, uh, you know, antiquote chambers and um, uh, engineering staff that we will go and work with our customers and, you know, for the application they have, 
we will physically take their items that they're trying to tag and evaluate it from an engineering standpoint. And we will select the best tag for both, uh, you know, the quality aspect or the sensitivity of the read as well as the cost. So all that to say, I, I have to say it, it depends on the application. Um, that's just inherent to the technology. With that being said, um, the costs have come down quite a bit. And so you're really looking at tags being in the range of, you know, and this is at high volume, but, you know, uh, in the range of five to seven cents. Um, and again, if you go back to, you know, 15 years ago or so, you know, or 10 years ago, you know, you were in that, you know, 20 to 30 cent range. So it's really come down. Um, Adrian, do you have a perspective on readers? Yeah, I mean, you know, from from our perspective, you know, listen, we we realize that we're, you know, one of the more expensive or sort of larger line items in a, in a pilot with our technology and then a full deployment. Um, but you got, you know, in the last, you know, call it 12, 18 months, you know, we've significantly reduced the size and cost of our technology in in our fourth generation product, which ultimately again makes it more scalable. Um, we do sell, you know, only to uh, to through our channel partners. And, and some of these guys are, 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 you know, getting significant volume discounts, which is, uh, which is fantastic through, through volume. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a set it up once and, and, and leave it. And, uh, you know, how you on your end capitalize that is, is up to your business. But, you know, your tag costs, the variable cost is, 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 is so small in comparison to, to other active RTLS solutions. Um, so we, we are seeing, you know, that paired up against, you know, the, the true ROI when you look at it from, you know, uh, from a high level. And ultimately, we work with, you know, cut, you know partners like Carrier Direct to really showcase that, that ROI in our reports um, as, as part of these pilots. Great. Well, terrific. Uh, want to thank all of our speakers for joining us today. This has been a you know really enlightening and interesting presentation. Uh, any questions for our speakers? Uh, feel free to send me an email at skifold.com, and I'd be happy to pass them along. Um, otherwise, I uh, hope you all enjoy the rest of your Friday. Stay safe and have a great weekend. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This does conclude today's conference call. You may disconnect your phone lines at this time and have a wonderful day. Thank you for your participation.